Yeah. Oh. I, my on off switch came on. Okay, you're in beginning a dissection with. With any dissection, it's always important to look at the external features first before jumping in there with your instruments. Um, you want to make sure that you try to rec see anything you can recognize here. I recognize connective tissue. I recognize some muscles, the external or extrinsic muscles that attach to the eyeball and would move it around in the eye orbit in the socket. Um, on, also on the back, you'll see something that looks much whiter then these yellowy, fatty, and then connective tissues. And that little round white thing right there is the optic nerve coming out the back of the eyeball. Now, there are going to be several layers of tissue in the eye. The outermost, very similar to what we saw in the central nervous system, the toughest. And this would be um, what we call the fibrous tunic. It's tough fibrous connective tissue. And the white colored connective tissue on the outside we refer to as the sclera or the white of the eye. Um, the more clear portion which in a healthy normal functioning eye would be much clearer than this. It's going to be cloudier due to the preservative and the fact that the animal is no longer living. Um, that's the cornea and that's continuous with the sclera. It's one continuous layer. Um, the, this Because this is really really tough you, I do not recommend using a scalpel because, again, as we saw with the dura mater on the brain, very hard to cut through that outer layer, and as you're pushing really hard and you finally get through, you're going to put so much pressure on there, you're going to have a little fountain of, of inner juice. So what I recommend is a scissor with some fine points on it, and I like to try to snip a little opening so that I can get one point of the scissor through there. Maybe poke a little hole. As you can see, this is pretty tough stuff. I have to really cut away. Oh, now I see a little juice, a little fluid coming out of there. We'll talk about that fluid in a moment when we get on the inside and take a look. We're going to cut right through the cornea. We're going to go all the way around the eyeball, gently. Remember, it's a little package with delicate things inside that you don't want to harm, even though it's pretty tough. Okay. And then we got to go this way. Well, that is tough stuff, I'll tell you. And we're going to kind of open that up like, like you would open an egg. Whoop! Look at that eye that popped right out of there. Okay, so we should see several interesting things here. The very liquid or watery material was found in the, the cavity here, what we call the... Of course, I can't get to it. Okay, We have the um, anterior chamber here and the posterior chamber back here. The dividing point would be this middle layer of the eye that contains the iris, in this case up in the front. Um, and that, that iris, which is made up of muscular tissue, is continuous with the middle layer of our three layers, which is called the choroid. And in that front an anterior area is the aqueous humor or very fluid watery material. In this larger posterior chamber, we have this gelatin-like material called the vitreous humor. Vitreous means glass, and so it's sort of glassy looking and um, very gelatinous. And that, you can see this, this right here is the lens, which looks white from the preservative and lack of uh, circulatory flow. This one, um, would be clear in, an, in a normal healthy eye. But that lens, we'll take a look at that a little bit more closely in a little bit, and then you'll notice this pattern on the front that um, has little lines radiating out from the center is an imprint with pigment from the inside of this eye, and that imprint oh. comes from the shape of the muscles that are part of that iris. So we're going to cut that out and take a look at it. 
Mm. We're going to see two types of muscles surrounding that, that are part of that iris and surround the opening in the middle, which is called the pupil. Okay. And what you hopefully can see, if the light, is the light good there? Yep, yep. What we can see is that around the middle part of the pupil are circular muscles that go all the way around the opening. And then attached to the outer edge of that are some what we call radiating or radial muscles that come out. Okay. The, when, if the muscles in that circular layer here were to get shorter, they would make the hole smaller. So the circular muscles are constricting, and they constrict the pupil. The radial muscles, when they get shorter, pull that const those constrictors out of the way, and so it makes the pupil larger. So these are your dilating muscles, the radial ones. Okay, I like to think of them as like rays of the sun. See the pattern of like the rays of the sun on there. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing you'll notice in here, in this chamber where we have the pigment, something that we don't see very often, we don't see in human eyes, and we only see in some animals, particularly animals that have better nocturnal vision than we do, is a structure called the tapetum lucidum. It looks a little bit like, I'm gonna push this creamy colored white material, which is retina aside, and we'll get to that, we'll look in the other part of the eye at that retina in a moment. But when you can, what you can see is this beautiful iridescent turquoise green area. That actually helps animals trap more light inside that chamber um, to help them see better at night. And that's why when you you flash a light in the eyes of a deer or a dog or a raccoon or a cat, it'll uh, reflect back at you in a, usually a different colors for different types of animals, yellow, green, mm -hmm. orange, and that's that tapetum lucidum. And hum, that's why human eyes don't do that, I guess, unless you're a vampire or something. And then, <laughs> so apparently we have some interesting eye things. Now, this creamy stuff that I moved aside was our innermost layer, what's called the neural layer, the choroid layer, which is this middle layer and which has the pigment on it and which goes continuous with the muscles, that re, the intrinsic internal muscles that regulate the pupil. That layer is referred to as the vascular layer. And the innermost layer is referred to as the neural layer is basically the retina. And the retina is very, very delicate. And one of the roles of this vitreous or glass-like humor is that it pushes the um, retina up flat against the back of the eyeball, kind of like if you were trying to project a movie onto a sheet on the wall and you want that sheet to be nice and flat or your mm -hmm. images would be distorted, this is your sheet and that vitreous humor presses that sheet out, and you can see if I just disturb it a little bit, so if I were to, someone were to have a blow to the head, a significant blow to the head, it could disturb this enough that it would wrinkle like this or shrivel up, and that's called the detached retina. So a bad head injury can cause that, sometimes can cause permanent damage, sometimes can re be repaired. And what you'll notice is that it just slips right off of that choroid layer, except for one little spot I can't seem to get it off this one little spot. That one little spot where it's attached is the spot where all of the axons from all of those nerve cells are going to exit the eyeball into the optic nerve. And so if I pull on that, you can see that little round opening, which on the other side is our, there's that optic nerve we found earlier when we were looking at the external part of the eyeball. Oh. This white structure right there is connected to that. And that's your blind spot. Because in that spot, you only have axons, no receptors. That means you can't see right there. And so that little, little, little bit. that little blind spot right there, there that yeah. little spot yeah. where that's attached, has no receptors, just axons. And so therefore, that's your blind spot. Your brain learns to compensate for that in your images. <clears throat> so you get enough information from the surrounding area that you don't notice that you have a blind spot. Your brain helps you to not notice that at all. Um, the last thing we're going to take a look at is the lens. We're going to kind of separate this lens off of here. When I was a younger person many years ago, we were working on frogs. We used to, they're so hard, so bouncy, those little lenses. We used to play marbles with them. <laughs> but one interesting thing that you'll notice um, if you, this is where you might try and use a scalpel, but you have to be careful because it is round. You know how it is when you're cutting peas. Shoot across your plate. If you cut into it, what you'll find is it's a lot like an onion. Notice I make a lot of food references. In that it has lots of layers inside there. Now, I don't know if we can see that real well. Let's see if I can grab that with a forceps. Maybe it's a little slick. Mm. Let's see here. 
Okay, and get the light on that just right. It has layers of protein. It's, it's just special proteins in that lens that are layer upon layer upon layer. And this is what focuses your image. And this lens is also connected to a set of muscles within that uh, choroid layer, um, which, which are attached to some special little ligaments called suspensory ligaments. And we call the little batch of muscles at the ends of these suspensory ligaments, suspended right here behind the pupil, we call that the ciliary body. And that ciliary body, when, um, when your brain is trying to help you focus, it will pull, and that will make the lens stretch and get a little flatter, and that will change the position of the image that you're looking at. And if it's, um, it loosens it up, that image moves a little bit closer, so it tries to get it to hit right on the back of that eyeball where the retina is. And if you don't do that very well, then you might need glasses. The glasses would then correct that distance in order to make it sit right on the back of that, right on the retina, your, your projector screen, so to speak, on the back of your eyeball. The other interesting thing about these proteins in the eye is when we go back and we look at this cornea, so usually the retina would be sort of clear, pretty clear, and the cornea should be clear. Um, they can get cloudy as you get older or from certain um, injuries or diseases. And you can get what are called cataracts and have those replaced or have the cataracts broken up. The cataracts are crystals that form in here and cloud up these, these layers. Um, but the material that's in the sclera is exactly the same material that's in the cornea. Why is this one white and this one clear? And that's because of the way that the fibers are aligned. And the fibers in the sclera are very uh, random, and they're kind of um, a reticulum or a mesh-like network where they're all going different directions, and that makes it opaque. No light can get through. Hmm. But it would be kind of like if you, you know, were taping over something, and you put lots of tape over there because you don't want to let any light in. Over here, the fibers all run in one direction. They're all parallel, kind of like Venetian blinds. So then that allows light in between those fibers, which gives it the appearance of being clear. Um, but basically it's the same kind of material. It's a collagen mm -hmm. for the most part um, and keratin, structural proteins that are st sturdy. And there you have a sheep eye. Hmm. Now this is the only part of the human body that doesn't get um, oxygen from the blood supply, is that correct, the cornea? Is it, or is that, or is the, the whole cornea. sclera? Uh, yeah, there's no, no, there's a few places in the body that don't get good blood oh, supply, okay. but where there have dense regular connective tissue, you do not get generally great blood supplies. Okay. And that's why those things are very hard to heal, like ligaments, tendons, cartilage has very little blood supply, and then the sclera has no blood supply. Okay. And um, the, actually the cornea doesn't either. It's interesting when somebody gets a red or a bloodshot eye, something we can't see on this sheep eye right now, when it's in the sheep, there'll be a very thin layer. In other words, the skin that's on the sheep's face, uh -huh. and same thing on a human, comes down over the surface of the cornea, just a thin, thin layer of skin. It's so thin that it's oh. clear. We call that thin layer of living skin. It's continuous with your eyelid, under your eyelid. Oh. We call that layer the conjunctiva. And when oh. some, that has blood vessels in it. And when somebody gets an infection in that or it gets irritated, then the blood flow increases in there to bring, you know, to heal. And so they'll get a bloodshot eye. They'll get a red eye. Mm -hmm. So the redness is from the conjunctiva, not from the cornea or the sclera itself. Okay.